morning and welcome to First Baptist Church of Denver. My name is Brian Henderson and I serve as the minister here. It is good to see all of us here uh, this morning. I know it is still the middle of August, which is almost the middle of summer and yet almost quite the end of summer. And so thank you to all of you for being here today in the midst of the heat and the smoke is beginning to clear, which is good, much better than it was last week. I'll say a few more words about welcome uh, after our call to worship and invocation and opening hymn. But for now, I want to invite you to join me in using your bulletin as we proclaim together this morning's call to worship. Today is the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. And so we proclaim together now these words. Come, be nourished by the words and the witness of Jesus Christ. He came that we might know of God's absolute steadfast love for us. Receive the gift of the bread of life and hunger no more. We are grateful for Jesus Christ who has given to us this magnificent gift. Come, let us worship and rejoice. Let us sing our praises to God. Amen. Will you join me as we pray? Lord of life and hope, we gather this day seeking nourishment for our souls and healing for our spirits. Give to us your living bread that, having been nourished in soul and spirit, we may be witnesses to your transforming love. Through the ministry and mission of Jesus Christ, the bread of life, we offer this prayer and offer ourselves now in and for this hour of worship. In Jesus' name. Amen. As you are able, please join us in standing. We're going to sing together hymn number 499, I Surrender All. And as you are able, we'll ask you to please wear your mask as we sing. Good to see you, and I am hopeful that in a time not long from now, we'll be able to resume our regular 
weekly time of reading where we take four or five, sometimes six or seven minutes and move around the sanctuary and greet each other and connect with each other. It's always a great moment for us and I know that we will get there again. Uh, but for today, I want to extend on behalf of everyone a welcome to all of you. For those of you who are visiting for the first time, we extend a special welcome to you. I know that we have some guests visiting from from one part of town and just from the other side of the capital even. And so for those of you who are here for the first time, we do welcome you to First Baptist. You'll find in the pew rack a welcome card. We'll invite you if you would like to complete that and following the service, you can leave that in the offering plate, which is here in the front of the sanctuary. And then this coming week, that will be our opportunity to respond and to write you, to share with you more about what happens at First Baptist. And even though we are still in this pandemic season, much continues to take place. It strikes me as quite remarkable what all has happened here at First Baptist over the last 18 months. Uh, much ministry continued to take place out of these historic walls, even while we were apart from each other as we were Sunday by Sunday. And ministry continues. You'll note some opportunities for ministry and fellowship in the announcements section of the bulletin. So please check out the potluck that's coming up. There is a sign up board in the narthex for you to sign up if you would like that we're going to gather together on September 12th. It's going to be fiesta themed, so we're going to have fun. There's an opportunity for you to serve through our membership committee. If you want to read about that, you can also there's an opportunity to participate with the Women's Homelessness Initiative, as well as an opportunity to serve with the Denver Rescue Mission. So please read up about all of those items. Next Sunday, we're going to add something special to our service, to our order of service. We're going to have a baptism. Uh, Catherine has been coming and reconnecting with First Baptist after having been away for about a decade or so, which we are grateful and so glad about. And she has requested to be baptized. And so next Sunday, we're going to have a baptism. I said to Catherine uh, over the last couple of weeks, I said, one of the ways in which your pastor is a literalist when it comes to reading scripture is when it comes to reading the story of, of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch asked to be baptized and Philip didn't say, okay, we're gonna organize a class and we're gonna make you go through so many sessions. Philip just said, okay, let's get you baptized. And the eunuch was baptized. And so next Sunday we will have a baptism. And if anyone else is interested, let me know because the baptistry will be full. And so if we can get one or two or three people in the baptistry at one time, not at the same time, but you know what I mean, in the same service, uh, that, would, that would be a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity. Good. It is good to be here. Thank you for your presence today. Know that your presence this morning is a gift and helps each of us in more ways than you know. In the spirit of, of presence, I want to invite us now to our time of prayer as God comes and leads us. This time all are invited to come forward to light a candle on behalf of a situation or a memory of someone, then to come to the podium and share in your own way. Be sensitive in what you share on the behalf of others, but of course, come gladly in prayer as we all stand in the need of prayer. After you share, just return to your seat and be mindful of the distance here. This morning I lit three candles, the first for our brothers and sisters and siblings in Haiti, who are enduring yet another disaster. We have ministry friends there and other partners, and we hold those dear people in prayer. It seems like it is something we can relate to quite well. The second is the candle for things unseen. 
there is so much that happens in this building and through this building that we really, and that includes me, don't always know. The Sunday worship is just one portion of the ministry, and so lighting a candle of prayer for the continued good works that happen through all of us. And last is for the preparation for baptism. Praise God. We'll be keeping you in prayer this week and let your light so shine. Won't you come here again as you're able and we'll pray together at the end. I light three candles this morning. One um, for Brian and one for Scott. Brian um, came and facilitated um, part of mom's service two weeks ago. Um, and his second doing that for my family. And Scott, a special thank you to you for sitting with my family for the entire viewing. That was your whole evening and it meant a great deal to my family. I am now looking forward to a difficult year first. I told Brian, the pastor, me and God are on tough terms right now. I don't doubt his rationale, but I question his timing. I had just gotten to know mom from mom, and he decided it was time for him to come home. And I'm not in agreement with that right now. So he and I are going to have to have some tough discussions over the coming year. But I thank God for this church and for these blessed pastors. number and said, I smell smoke. They came, they walked into her apartment, they looked, they smelled, and they ran out. And a neighbor downstairs had a smoldering fire going. They could not wake that neighbor up with the baby either. Broke down the door, went in, put out the fire, and you know, my daughter can be annoying in the things that she notices, which may or may not be there. But in this case, she was not just right, but I truly believe she saved lives, and I am so grateful.
Massachusetts, and just like her father who was in the Peace Corps, I just pray that God will be with her and follow her on her journey, wherever it may lead her, and that she will trust in Him. Because the world is trying to swallow them up, and they're just two of the nieces and nephews that I have, and I have, I'm a great, great auntie. I have a hundred or so of them, and um, I just pray that God will watch over them. Thank you. I lit three candles this morning. The first, in the spirit of Scott's prayer for the people of Haiti, I offer a prayer for the people of Afghanistan as they continue once more to experience great upheaval and uncertainty about their future and about their very lives. My second candle I light for Lita Batley. Lita usually sits next to Kat up here in the first pew. I shared last week that Lita had fallen. Uh, this week, uh, Lita wound up in a rehabilitation facility and she'll be there probably for another week or so. So I wanted to offer her and I reassured her that her church family would be remembering her. And then my third prayer is, again, for my children. Uh, my kids and I had a great week in New Jersey, and they are now traveling home from New Jersey with their mom by car to Ohio. So I pray uh, God's traveling mercies on them as they go. I give you thanks today for knowing that my soul is anchored in you. There are so many different ports in the storm, but knowing I have a home in your heart means so much to me and so much to us. Anyone will have us in our hour of trouble, but only you, God, can keep us. The constraints of time and rules and regulations sometimes dominate our lives, but it is the true relationship with you through Christ that regulates our comings and our goings. We give you thanks for drawing us here today to be healed, to listen, to be encouraged in our service, and to be lifted. Help us to place our trust and confidence in you. Let us feast on the bread of life who has given to us the best example of what it means to truly serve and witness your love. We encourage us to serve you and love you more fully. Let the light shine even greater through us and to those around us, even in our hour of need. You've heard our prayers spoken. We now lift those unspoken, those absent from this place, those present with us in spirit. Hear our prayer, God. We give you thanks for the answers even before they're given. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now I have this morning's sacred reading. Today's reading is found in your bulletin, of course, in the Bible, in the 
bound edition or on your phone, we have so many ways. But however you find it, point to the gospel named for Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. And again, for convenience, it's in your bulletin here in the sanctuary. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him and went a little further. He saw James, son of Zebedee and brother of John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Who help us 
when we're sad, who help us when we have something to do that we can't do by ourselves, or our friends. Help us to recognize how important they are to us. <coughs> Amen. Let's go on. Thank you again to Nancy and our children. Our children's responses this morning caught my attention, and I have to say that their responses to some of Nancy's questions about that story of Jesus were really, really good. We're continuing today in our sermon series based on the gospel named for Mark. As we shared last week, Mark's gospel is the earliest of the four gospels, and it's also the gospel that Matthew and Luke both used to craft their books. Different from Matthew and Luke, though, Mark moves along, as I said last week, at a pretty quick pace. When reading it, one can read it in its entirety in about 30 to 45 minutes. And so I'll encourage you again, if you haven't already, to take time to read through Mark. Make this a goal of yours, if you will. Allow this time for you to be set apart so that you can read and reflect and perhaps even pray. I would suggest, too, that Mark gets to the point with the stories it tells, prompting us as its readers to often respond to the pressing questions, how then shall I or we live? And in light of this person named Jesus and all that he did and stood for, how then will I or we even live our lives differently? Last week, we began by looking at Mark 1, verses 1 through 4. We reflected together on the significance of the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ and considered what beginnings we've each experienced. And then we asked how the good news of God's love might begin or begin again in each of our lives. Today, as Scott read for us and as Nancy just reflected with our children, we haven't exactly begun with good news, though, have we? If only life would go the way that I think it should or how I want it to go in my mind. When you were a kid or when you were younger, didn't you have ideas and hopes and dreams of how your life might unfold? I did. Some of my hopes and dreams have unfolded and honestly, many have not. Marilyn Monroe once said, dreaming about being an actress is more exciting than being one. Life has a way of being life, and life happens. We can't control it. We can't change what's taken place already. Sometimes life rolls along smoothly and with good momentum and with seemingly with some ease, and then it doesn't. For our family last fall, by all counts, life was good. Our children were growing becoming teenagers. They were managing well their way through their school year, even with a pandemic. While siblings can struggle to get along sometimes, our kids, in truth, did really well in that department. Or, I mean, they, they didn't do well in not getting along. They do pretty well in getting along most of the time. In general, our family life was good. And then, seemingly out of nowhere, our son Joel, the youngest of the three was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. His life and our family's life was forever changed. It was hard to adjust to the reality that for some reason, a reason we'll never really know, but for some reason Joel's body will never again function the way that it had up until the early months of last fall. And for him, now in order to keep his body functioning in healthy ways. He will forever be monitoring his blood sugar levels. He will forever be checking his carb count before every meal that he eats. And he'll be needing to make sure that his body always has enough insulin. Our family meal times are different. Joel's snack times are different. 
His bedtime routine is different. Every time he walks out the door, he needs to make sure that his fanny pack has all of the elements in it that he needs should his blood sugar level plummet or skyrocket for whatever reason. Life happens. How has life happened for you? What incidents or events or realities have happened for you that have caught you off guard, that have caused you to have to live, think, or even believe differently? Perhaps even to reconsider your, priori your priorities and even the ways in which you spend your time. Some things happen in life that are what they are. They don't change things too much for us, but then other things happen and they change a heck of a lot for us. As Scott read, now after John was arrested, a little further into Mark's gospel, we read more about John's fate. Suffice to say here at the outset of the gospel, this may have been an event that caught Jesus and his family and his friends off guard. Perhaps, maybe, maybe not, but nonetheless, we can imagine that this event must have cast a shadow on the day for Jesus and for all those who cared for John. Someone they knew and loved, someone who perhaps they kept in contact with regularly, someone with whom they sat at tables and shared meals and moments together, was no longer with them. And we can imagine that this must have impacted all of them, practically, emotionally, and psychologically, even as events in our lives affect us today. The verse that follows, verse 14, becomes even more meaningful. We heard Scott read in verse 15, Jesus' words, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news. In essence, I wonder if this is the gospel writer's way of reminding us as readers that even when life doesn't go the way that we think or the way that we want, when life throws us a curveball, when we get dealt lemons, when we struggle with all that can and will happen to us personally and even communally, we can still have hope, we can still move forward, we can still trust that not all is lost, that there is yet meaning and purpose and some good to be experienced in my life and in life in general. I recall those words that were found on a wall in the cellar of a house in Germany after World War II, words that some of you probably know. They've been put even to music. I believe in the sun even when it is not shining. I believe in love even when I feel it not. I believe in God even when God is silent. The good news of Jesus Christ is news that reminds us that in part we can keep on keeping on. We can lean into the realities and the emotions and the feelings and circumstances that life brings and we can still have hope, we can move forward, all is not lost. And speaking of hope, our text that Scott read concludes with the calling of the first disciples about which Nancy shared with our children the calling of Simon and Andrew and James and John, fishermen. Now, if God can call fishermen, God can use you. God can use teachers and laborers. God can use professors and custodians. God can use preachers and retirees and florists and salesfolk and funeral home employees and engineers and communications and marketing folk and attorneys and city and state employees and hospital administrators and eye doctors, office folk and office managers and hairstylists and administrative assistants and interior designers and you name it. God can use you. Now sometimes when we read these accounts of Jesus calling his disciples, we might get the impression that folk literally, literally dropped everything and followed Jesus immediately without regard for what surely must have been realities for which they were responsible. It's how the story has always been told to us, isn't it? Jesus said, follow me, and Simon and Andrew dropped their nets and they followed him. It sounds so dramatic. I mean, if I was Zebedee, who we read about here too, 
James and John's dad, I've been a bit upset and worried, and I'd have been wondering, what on earth am I going to do? James and John, what are you doing? Did, did you think about this? Did we talk about this? Where are you going? What are you, what, what are you doing? There is obviously <laughs> many details that the gospel writers don't give us. So, I suspect, having read a little bit, I suspect that these early disciples didn't walk away entirely from their families to follow Jesus. I mean, it makes for a dramatic moment, though, doesn't it? It seems only fair, though, to think that there was a bit more to their decision to follow, to learn from, to become friends of, to experience life with Jesus. This week, Kurt Kaufman, our ministerial associate and who manages our church office, was organizing some of our church archives. And in all that he sorted through, he found some meaningful documents. One of those documents was a congregational profile that had been written in the, in the mid 80s as First Baptist at that point in time was beginning to search for a new senior minister. In addressing what gifts and skills would be important in the next minister, it was noted in this profile, quote, the ability to arouse enthusiasm among church members is the greatest asset one can possess. And it went on to say, the best thing one can do is develop three qualities for individuals, three qualities that individuals need the most. And they are vision, imagination, and courage. Through vision, the profile goes on, we will see things as they really are. Through imagination, we will dream what great things can be. And through courage, we will act boldly to make those dreams come true. It seems to me that this is the invitation that disciples of Jesus of all time are given. And I wonder if this might just be what Jesus was inviting the folk of his time to, to have vision, to imagine, and to have courage. I wonder what we might yet see for our lives today. I wonder what we might yet see for the First Baptist Church of Denver. Yes, we're living through difficult days. Yes, we're living through <coughs> smoky times. Yes, we're living through moments of racial and societal unrest. Yes, we're living through a political process that just is draining. We are living through so much. We're living through a time when not just First Baptist Denver, but churches all over our city and all over our country are wondering, is there still a future for us? What are we going to do? Why aren't we like we once were? What's going to happen? How can we meet the needs of those in our community? I wonder what we might yet see for the life of First Baptist Church of Denver. Will you imagine with me? Will you believe with me that there is far more we can do together than any of us can do on our own? Will you join me in imagining that, yeah, church doesn't need to be the way that it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, a half a century ago. Church needs to be what it is today. We need to be who we are right here in these pews. Whether there will be 10 of us, whether there will be 100 of us, what can we do together to share the good news, that sense of God's love, that sense of hope, that sense that life doesn't always have to be the way that it is, that we can move forward and believe and trust that there is still life to be lived and love to be shared. Will you imagine with me? Will you be daring too? On your mark, get set, let's go.
be mm. Amen. You may be seated. Please know, hold on. Please know that your gifts and pledges of support to First Baptist Church of Denver and our ministry are meaningful and necessary in so many ways. Our church community has been blessed with your generous support and we ask you to continue to give your gifts by mailing to the church office for those of you who are online or giving on your way out in the plates here. Remember, we can still donate on the church's website using the donate button right on the home page. However you give, know that it will improve, enrich, and allow us to flourish together as one. Uh, following the post, we'll just ask you to again exit through these doors and then out onto the patio for the reception, but do stay for the post loop. Now, I offer us this blessing. Depart now in the fellowship of God, the Mother, Father, Spirit, and Comforter. And as you go, remember, in the goodness of God, you were born into this world. By the grace of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this hour. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus, you are being redeemed. Amen. Amen.